Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. And in this uh, part two video of a series of two, I'm going to talk, continue to talk about the tipping points in the Earth system. Um, and tonight I'm focusing on the ocean and atmospheric uh, circulation patterns. So we've been operating, we've been lucky to have a fairly stable Earth that's operating within a zone of stability. And as climate change proceeds at ever accelerating rates, it's not increasing at a linear rate, it's increasing at extremely fast exponential rates. The risk is that we get out of this zone of stability, that the, the, the perturbations to the Earth system get so large that there's um, basically permanent changes that there's a rewiring, if you like, of the global circulation patterns. And that will make it more and more difficult to uh, continue to grow food to the levels that we're do presently uh, doing to feed the global population. So I'm looking at, continuing off, I'm looking at the AMOC, the ocean current. And what we see here is you've got the, the Gulf Stream coming up here. The red is the surface currents, and there's a loop here, but there's also a branch that comes right up and crosses the Atlantic and comes right up into the Arctic here, another branch here. As this, as this water is moving northward, it's cooling down, it's very salty, so it sinks down, and the the uh, blue and the purple are the very deep water. So it sinks down, and then it comes back down um, as uh, as bottom water. There's also a, a there's also the green color is the intermediate level water. Okay, about halfway down. So this is although this curve looks th th this plot looks very complex with lots of movements, lots of lines. It's actually not that bad. So the problem is, is as the Arctic continues to warm more and more and more, and the water is fresher up here, we could lose these northward loops. Okay, we could have a reconfiguration of the AMOC into this sort of pattern here, and that will have profound implications for the planet. Okay, so this is a huge uh, tipping point, if you like, um, on the system. Uh, Wikipedia has good basic information. So the shutdown of the thermohaline circulation um, is here, and it talks about the weakening of the AMOC that's occurred, um, and some, some recent research about the... Um, Here's a 2015 study showing exceptional slowdown in the last century. Greenland melt is a possible contributor, putting the fresh water on the surface of the ocean. The slowdown since the 70s has been unprecedented over the last millennium. And because the Gulf Stream is slowing down, the water can pile up on the U.S. East Coast. And if it continues to slow down, there's a potential to divert three to four times the rate of sea level rise on the U.S. East Coast compared to the global average. Of course, there's huge implications and huge effects on the planet. Now, another tipping point was mentioned as the Pacific, uh, Pacific Decadal Oscillation changing and the ENSO changing, the El Nino the ENSO, E-N-S-O, El Nino Southern Oscillation. So this is the case where you have an El Nino. The water is very warm near the, uh, near the equator, all the way to South America. The opposite case is, so, so this water is warmed up on the far uh, west parts of the Pacific. The trade winds that are blowing from east to west slow down, and this water piles up across the Pacific in this form. The opposite effect is if the winds are stronger and the, on all the hot water is kept over on this side. This is the La Nino effect. And this is the, the Pacific uh, decadal oscillation 
more relates to what's happening in the North Pacific. So this is a positive phase. You have warm water near the west coast of the US and you've got cold water throughout the Central Pacific, North Pacific. And in the negative phase, you've got the warm water here and you've got the cold water here. Okay, so these sort of patterns are shifting as climate change proceeds and these represent uh, large, you know, the danger is with the El Nino is instead of every two to seven years, um, it becomes almost like a permanent state. And this will, will cause a lot more warming. Um, the, this is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation Index, how it varies from 1900 um, to about 2010 here. And this is a global temperature anomaly. And what you can do is you can relate some of these, um, like 1998 um, is about here, you know, a spike here in the global temperature and that you can relate it to the changes in the Pacific Decadal Oscillation Index. Um, this article here, you can just Google the title, um, gives you a lot of information about the, the PDO. Okay, we've all heard and know about the ENSO, the El Nino, the La Nina, but this is the this is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So this is a difference from the average temperature you get a very cold area here in the northern Pacific and you get a very warm area here along the uh, along the uh, coast of, of uh, North America. Okay, this is how the PDO has changed from 1900 to 2016. Okay, and what you can see is, you know, there's, there's generally a PDO here being positive here and then it goes mostly into a negative phase here. And so on. So that has, so that can basically be impacted and changed by the, um, by by you know there, there's tipping points in this where it can shift from one state to the to the other state. Um, and what you can see here is this is precipitation anomalies here, um, and it's correlated to the PDO. Okay, so if the PDO is um, so if the if the PDO is positive, you basically get less rain, okay, negative index, more rain, and uh, you can also correlate it with the ENSO as well, okay, with the with an El Nino or with the La Nina, okay, and the point is is that these things are all shifting um, as climate change proceeds. Um, this is how the El Nino, um, basically the conditions of it, and I expanded it here. Um, okay, well this is the article that it's from, very good description of the El Nino, the normal condition, the La Nina condition, and how these things affect coral reefs, for example, um, specifically in this article. Um, but this is, th this is some of the key points here. Okay, so these are the trade winds blowing here, okay, and if these guys weaken, this water that builds up, this warm water sloshes across the uh, Pacific uh, towards and hits uh, South America, so it brings this very, very warm water across. This is, this is a normal condition, there's more power in these um, trade wind and that keeps the water over on this side so the thermocline is steeper here when the water sloshes across it flattens out the thermocline and then the opposite condition is if these winds are very very strong and then the water is pushed even more to the uh, western pacific so this is the la nina condition okay so again the risk of the tipping point is that we tend to get we get almost a permanent El Nino uh, state. Okay, um, of course the jet streams, I've talked about um, a lot. Um, and this just as a reminder that, okay, so this tipping point in the jet streams is that the, um, this is basically the jet streams, they rise at the equator, you get the Hadley cell it's like a gear, you get the feral cell, you get the polar cell. 
and you get the jet streams here and here, and they circulate the planet. So as the Arctic is warming and warming and warming, you're, okay, so the tropopause, the air is very warm at the equator. So this distance here is about 17 kilometers. It's about seven kilometers here because the Arctic is cold. As the Arctic is warming, it brings this up higher and higher. It can expand this. You know, you can eliminate a whole cell perhaps, um, but the jet stream becomes slower and wavier and that increases the frequency, severity, and duration of extreme weather events. Now the Indian, the monsoon here, the monsoon, as the jet streams slow down and become weaker and have less um, force in guiding weather patterns, the, it's, it's very, very likely that monsoonal effects will start to take over. So basically these monsoonal effects um, arise because of the different heat capacity of the land versus the oceans. So when this whole area heats up, the land will heat up much faster than the oceans. So the, we've got a hot land, hot over the land, colder over the oceans, hot air rises over the land surface, creates a low pressure at the surface. Therefore, it draws in warm, humid air from the ocean, which then convects upwards, causing you know tremendous rainfall. That would be the monsoon off. The opposite case is the monsoon that would be the monsoon on, sorry, and, and the opposite case is um, if the is in the fall, for example, uh, the the temperature air temperatures drop, the land will cool down a lot more than the ocean. So now the hot air rises over the oceans and the air is pulled from the land. Okay, so that's the monsoon is off, very, very dry conditions over the land. Um, okay, so this uh, talks about the um, this this is a visualization showing the monsoon, showing the dates, so periods with absolutely no rain, and then periods with tremendous amounts of rain when the monsoon is on, and then the monsoon is off. So we'll be seeing this sort of behavior many, many more locations as the influence of the jet streams on the, on the weather patterns uh, shifts. So this shows some of the trends um this is this is the distribution if you like the number of years with rainfall uh totals uh down below here so the 110 year average about almost 900 millimeters of uh rainfall here okay um plus or minus 20 percent variation rains that are 10 percent exceed 10 percent higher than normal lead to major flooding 10% shortfall, significant droughts. Okay, so there's a, there's a lot of information here on how the, the monsoons um, are changing. So again, just uh, the mon look up monsoons of South Asia on Wikipedia to get this uh, particular site. Now, of course, in Africa, we also have these monsoons occurring. We, in this case, we have the, there's a location of the intertropical convergence zone which is where there's rising air and lots of rainfall. So we get a pushing, we get, a, we get uh, large amounts of rainfall underneath here. And if this whole thing shifts down, then the rainfall shifts down and these areas um, become basically drought and it's very, very difficult to grow food. Okay, so there's uh, lots of information on the African monsoon and how it affects the Sahara Desert and the Sahel. Now there's also, um, okay, there's also, there, there's, this is introduction to tropical meteorology, global circulation, you know, a very good description of all of the, the gory details of the monsoon. Um, now we have our North American version, okay? We have a North American monsoon and let's talk a little bit about this. So this is the, this is shown here. This is the percentage of precipitation that falls in July, August, September. Most of it follows, falls then, right? So the problem is, is this, the, the peaks are diminishing and we're getting a drying out in this region, which represents an 